I will be focusing on Long Island women and the suffrage campaigns, but I want to begin with the national situation for background. The women's suffrage movement started at a tea party in upstate New York. That was in 1848, but eight years earlier in 1840 was the world's anti-slavery convention in London, where Elizabeth Cady Stanton first met Lucretia Mott and her husband, James, who were delegates to that meeting. James Mott grew up on Long Island, Sands Point, and his wife became so well known that he was known as Mr. Lucretia Mott. In 1840, Katie Stanton was 25 years old and newly married. Her husband, uh, Henry Stanton, like the two Motts, was a delegate to the 1840 Anti-Slavery Convention. Women were active in the anti-slavery movement, but the London Convention would not seat Lucretia Mott, so she had to sit in the balcony with Katie Stanton. They became good friends and resolved to do something about the situation of women when they returned to the United States. But family responsibilities intervened for both. And it was not until 1848 that uh, they met again. Stanton now had three young children and she would eventually have seven children. Uh, the Stantons were living in Seneca Falls in upstate New York in the Finger Lakes region. Lucretia Mott was in the area for a Quaker meeting. They met for tea in near, nearby Waterloo, three other women who like Mott were Quakers. They decided to call what, what they published as a quote, convention to discuss the social, civil and religious rights of women the next week and to meet in uh, the Wesleyan Chapel in Seneca Falls. The first time I visited Seneca Falls uh, in the 1980s, the building was a laundromat. Well, they have reconstructed it now for the site of that convention. And Katie Stanton provided a prepared a declaration of sentiments modeled on the 1776 Declaration of Independence. And it began when in the course of human events, but we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. And the first of the repeated injuries and usurpations on the part of man to woman was he has never permitted her to exercise her inalienable right to the elective franchise. In one of the some 20 resolutions stated, and I quote, it is the duty of the women of this country to secure to themselves their sacred right to the elective franchise. When Lucretia Mott first heard that, she said, oh, Lizzie, thee will make us look ridiculous. We must go slowly. Katie Stanton's hen husband, Henry Stanton, threatened to leave town if she left it in. She left it in and he left town that day. The women asked James Mott to preside at that convention, which attracted more than a 300 women and men. It was the last time that a man presided uh, because it was a woman at every subsequent convention. Frederick Douglass, who attended, supported the resolution uh, for voting, and it passed by a narrow majority. All the other resolutions were unanimous. Um, there were 67 women and 32 men who signed the declaration, and that convention has conventionally been viewed as the beginning of the organized women's suffrage movement in America. Soon Stanton was joined by Elizabeth Cady, by Stanton was joined by Susan B. Anthony, who you see here. She was not at Seneca Falls. Anthony was first involved in the temperance movement against liquor. Anti-slavery and temperance were concerns of Stanton, Anthony, and many other women reformers. Suffrage was much more radical. These three women, worked tirelessly for suffrage for the rest of their long lives. This statue 
a monument has sometimes derisively been called three women in a bathtub. Officially, as you see here, it's the portrait monument. The government was pressured to move it from the basement to a more prominent location in the Capitol in the 1990s, though women had to raise the money to move it. I should mention that in England, the term usually used was suffra suffragette, as in a recent film on the English movement. There were distinctions in America during the years of suffrage activity between the terms suffragette and suffragist. Suffragette usually implied uh, greater militancy. I'm going to use uh, the term suffragist suffragist and ignore those differences in this talk. Um, some of the militant Americans had worked earlier in the English suffrage movement. That was true of Elizabeth Cady Stanton's daughter, Harriet Stanton Blatch of Rosalie Jones, Lucy Burns, and Alice Paul. Susan B. Anthony is not a Long Islander. She was born in Adams in Western Massachusetts, and as an adult lived in Rochester, New York. Her two homes are now museums that you can visit. Anthony did come to Jamaica and to Riverhead on Long Island in 1894 to speak and to collect signatures for a state suffrage amendment. She visited every county in New York State. She collected more than 332,000 signatures. The measure lost at that time. It received only one third of the votes in New York's Constitutional Convention. Elizabeth Cady Stanton visited her son in the 1890s in the summer homes that he rented in Hempstead, Glen Cove, and Great Neck, and visited her daughter, Margaret, in Shoreham, where Stanton wrote her memoir entitled 80 Years and More. I understand that every child who came to the door in Shoreham was taught to say, I believe in votes for women. But otherwise on Long Island, suffrage activities were nearly invisible until the 1910s. Lucretia Mott, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Lucy Stone, and Susan B. Anthony uh, each lived well into their 80s. Anthony was the last to die in 1906, uh, and it was the time for the second generation of leaders. Uh, later, I will speak more about Stanton's daughter and granddaughter, whom you see here. I'm skipping over the national events to focus now on Long Island. A chronological approach is difficult uh, because almost all the Long Island women were involved in the same half dozen years in the 1910s, but in different positions and organizations. So I will speak about the roles of individual women. First, Ida Bunsamis, who organized the first women's suffrage organization in Suffolk County in her hometown of Huntington. It was the Political Equality League that was affiliated with the mainstream state and national suffrage organizations. Samus had been active in the temperance movement and Frances Willard became active in suffrage and added thousands of women to the cause as uh, in the, uh, Willard was president of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the WCTU. Uh, but what that meant Though it added many women, it also meant that the liquor industry uh, was activated to spend a lot of money opposing suffrage. Uh, they were afraid that if women got the vote, that they would vote against a uh, vote to end the sale of alcoholic beverages. When the 18th Amendment enacting prohibition was enacted in 1919, it removed that obstacle to women's suffrage. But back to Ida Samus. In Huntington, the parlor meetings of the Political Equality League in Samus's home included a broader agenda than suffrage. For example, the Political Equality League also worked for sanitary conditions in schools. They wanted to end the common drinking cup and to use paper rather than cloth towels. 
After suffrage was secured in New York State in 1917, Samus ran for the New York State Assembly in 1918. She defeated a four-term incumbent in the primary and was endorsed in the general election by both the Republican and Prohibition parties. Samus was one of the first two women in New York to be elected to the State Assembly. Among her first acts was polishing the cuspidor or spittoon by her seat, fitting it with fern, filling it with ferns. Uh, 10 of the 14 bills she introduced were successful, including one equalizing pay for men and women in state hospitals who were doing the same work. This was important for doctors, nurses, and aides at Long Island's huge state mental hospitals in Central Islip, Kings Park, and Pilgrim State in Brentwood. Samus is credited with success of a bill regulating hours for women elevator operators. Although Samus ran for re-election, she was defeated. Her groundbreaking equal pay legislation foreshadowed one of today's still critical issues. Samus outlived three husbands, so she's, she is sometimes referred to as Ida Bunce Samus Woodruff Satchwell. Her home on Main Street in Huntington survives, and there is a roadside marker that was erected there in 2019. Many of the suffrage leaders on Long Island were wealthy women from New York City who had country homes on the island. They had the time and thanks to servants, to uh, leisure to spend on suffrage. I like to refer to them as the socialite suffragists. And one of those was Margaret Olivia or Mrs. Russell Sage who had country homes in Lawrence and Sag Harbor. Her home in Sag Harbor is today's whaling museum, which you've probably visited there. Sage uh, was the subject, this is the biography of a recent biography of her, a 1921 portrait of her. After her husband died, Sage became a prominent philanthropist and she was also a suffragist. In fact, she was converted to suffrage when Elizabeth Cady Stanton visited her at her summer home in Lawrence. Uh, that home no longer stands, but she is one of the early socialite suffragists and a celebrity suffragist, uh, a patroness. She gave a lot of money. Sage joined Catherine Mackey, who had a country home in Roslyn. Mackey organized the Equal Franchise Society in New York City in 1908, and like Sage, contributed significant sums of money to the cause. Incidentally, Mackey was elected to the Roslyn School Board in 1905. Women could vote in country school districts in New York from 1880. Mackey ran away to Paris with her husband's doctor, leaving her three children behind. She eventually divorced her husband, Clarence and married the doctor, so, but she dropped out of the suffrage movement in 1910, but not before she had introduced uh, uh, Mrs. Alva Vanderbilt Belmont to the suffrage cause. When she was married to uh, William K. Vanderbilt, Alva lived at Idle Hour in Oakdale. That was until a few years ago, the home of Dowling College, uh, after getting divorced, uh, it, no, first she got accepted into New York society before, and then she divorced um, the, uh, Vanderbilt and married Oliver Hazard Perry Belmont. You may have visited Marble House that Alva built in Newport. After her second husband, OHP Belmont, died in 1908, Alva became involved in suffrage. She started the Political Equality Association in New York City, paying rent for rooms on Fifth Avenue for that organization and for the National American Woman Suffrage Association, which was the largest suffrage organization in the country. A recent biographer has estimated that Belmont's contributions to suffrage were the equivalent of more than $10 million today.
Alva Belmont had two estates on Long Island. You're looking here at the one in Sands Point and it doesn't stand, uh, but nor does her East Meadow uh, mansion uh, survive. At, in East Meadow, Brooke Holt, uh, she organized the Brooke Holt branch of the Political Equality Association in 1911. She spent meek, uh, speakers to put meetings, uh, speakers to meetings to put Long Island uh, on the map as, she, as the press put it. She even had a suffrage farm on her property in East Meadow for two years. And a local newspaper reported, and I'll quote, Mrs. O.H.P. Belmont has announced that she will not open her suffrage farm at Hempstead this summer. Her plan was to teach young women how to uh, run a farm. The girls were thought to have enjoyed themselves thoroughly, but not to have learned much about farming. Some, despite Mrs. Belmont's admonitions, were given to wearing high-heeled slippers and gay dresses, poorly adapted to rough work on the farm. Few gave promise of becoming good farmers or of starting out for themselves as tillers of the soil. In fact, one of them even smoked cigarettes. Mrs. Belmont was disgusted, gave up the farm, and so we don't blame her. Belmont was important, and that's end of quote. Belmont was important in the more radical wing of the suffrage movement and continued to support the National Women's Party in the 1920s, donated their headquarters in Washington, D.C. Although they had to move to a new location, the Sewell Belmont House and Museum survives. And in 2016, President Obama proclaimed it the Belmont Paul Women's Equality National Monument. Alice Paul's name was added to the site. Paul is a national leader, was a national leader, a founder of the Women's Party, author of the Equal Rights Amendment in 1923. But alas, Paul was from New Jersey, not Long Island, so I won't be discussing her this morning, though. She certainly was very important in the national suffrage movement. My favorite local suffragist is Rosalie Gardner Jones. I've used different terms at various times to describe her. She was a maverick, radical, unconventional. Someone called her eccentric, but I think that's a bit harsh. In the family, her niece, whom I met, said she was always admonished when she was growing up, don't be like your Aunt Rosalie. But Mary Jones grew up to admire her. Rosalie Gardner Jones was born in New York City, but her family had deep roots on Long Island. Her mother, Mary Jones, uh, inherited Jones Manor in the Cold Spring Harbor area in 1882. And that house, burned down in 1909, and then she built this uh, home, uh, a 125,000 square foot concrete house on her property. Rosalie lived in those houses in her early and later years. This house still stands in today's Laurel Hollow near the Nassau Suffolk border, privately owned. Rosalie was a socialite. But as a suffragist, she rebelled against that background. She traveled in the United States and Europe where she first encountered women's suffrage activities. And once home again in 1911, she placed suffrage signs and slogans prominently on land that she owned in Syosset. She began to speak for suffrage initially in Roslyn and then in New York City, joining with Alva Belmont and Harriet Stanton Blatch, who was Katie Stanton's daughter. And she joined Elizabeth Freeman on a 1912 tour of Long Island in a horse-drawn suffrage wagon. Freeman had been born in England, uh, came to the United uh, States and Long Island as a child, then as an adult returned to England 
uh, worked as a speaker, organizer, and coordinator of the British Women's Social and Political Union from 1905 to 1911, probably met Rosalie Jones there. And then she returned to the United States. Rosalie Jones was president of the Na Nassau County branch of the National American Women's Suffrage Association, or NASA as it's sometimes called, uh, from 1912 to 1913. She organized a hike from New York City to Albany in December 1912 to gain publicity and present a suffrage petition to the governor. Rosalie's mother uh, and her sister, Louise, uh, were uh, members of the New York State Anti-Suffrage Association. Her mother tried to uh, dissuade her from making the height. She said it was ridiculous, absolutely foolish. But here is Rosalie at the beginning of the first day of that hike. They had a drummer, war correspondent, who there were reporters, and a commissary wagon with food and supplies. Um, they carried votes for women banners, yellow knapsacks, and or tote bags, yellow was the suffrage color. Uh, Jones appointed herself general and she organized things militarily. Her second in command was Colonel Ida Kraft from Brooklyn, who you see here in the center. And this is the petition that they were to present to the governor. Um, it was signed by heads of New York City suffrage organizations, including Nora Blatch, uh, uh, I'll speak more about her later, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton's granddaughter. The hikers uh, took 12 days to cover more than 150 miles. They walked all the way. Uh, they had made some detours to distribute leaflets. They made speeches along the way. Uh, others, there were five who completed the full uh, hike. Others and some men joined them for portions of the march. They encountered rain, cold, snow, in fact, a blizzard on the way. The hike or pilgrimage attracted so much publicity that General Jones announced a march from New York to Washington DC in February to present a suffrage petition to President-elect Wilson. That suffrage army started in Newark, covered more than 250 miles in just over two weeks. This time the hikers wore brown pilgrim capes with hoods, as you can see here. Um, you can even see a film of a portion of the march on the website, on the web. Uh, Rosalie Jones became a celebrity. This, here she is uh, in Washington. And again, speaking, uh, leading the march. This cartoon uh, model appeared in the Cleveland Plain Dealer based on Leutz's painting of George Washington crossing the Delaware in the revolution. Rosalie wanted to recreate that crossing and there was too much ice, so they were unable to do so. But the hikers joined the suffrage parade in the Capitol the day before Wilson's inauguration. And when Wilson arrived at the train station in Washington, um, he asked, where are all the people? Because there were only a few there to greet him. And they were all watching the suffrage parade. And Rosalie's martyrs, as, she, as they called themselves, uh, were relegated to the back of the parade. The mainstream suffrage organization, I think, were uh, jealous that she was getting so much publicity. There was almost a riot in Washington with the parade that day. Point out the megaphone she's carrying, because you'll see it again in, in a different context. Um, when you voted in November 19, 19, 2017, you should have received this sticker. And that is Rosalie Jones, though she's not identified in the, uh, on the sticker, but uh, you can see her, it's the artist used this uh, photograph for the sticker. Uh, 
Jones seemed tireless when she returned to Long Island. Uh, after the hike, she organized and conducted a series of pageants and parades. The suffrage prayed to Hempstead in May 1913. And there is now a historic marker in front of the uh, old courthouse in Mineola commemorating that event. In July, she had a 10 day votes for women campaign traveling in a yellow horse-drawn wagon. In September, she arranged an all night suffrage aviation and encampment meeting at the Hempstead Plains Aviation Field in Garden City. Many flights were canceled because of the rain, but 50 women slept in one of the hangars. Rosalie flew over Staten Island. She, uh, she was not the pilot, but as the passenger, she was dropping suffrage leaflets from the plane. And it, that was at a time when flying in airplanes was so dangerous. Jones organized another hike to Albany in 1914 up the west side of the river, campaign for suffrage in several states in the Midwest. The next year, she spoke on suffrage on Long Island, campaigned in New Jersey and New York City. She apparently dropped out of the suffrage activities after the defeat of the 1915 suffrage referendum in New York. She focused on continuing her own education. Governor Cuomo announced in 1917 that a statue of Rosalie Jones would be erected in front of the Cold Spring Harbor Library a few miles from her home. Alas, that statue has been on hold for the last two years, although he, the, he had announced at the same time a, a statue for Sojourner Truth, and that was unveiled in Ulster County in 2020. Jones dropped out of the suffrage movement to pursue her education. She completed her BA and law degrees, including a doctorate and within a few years. Another wealthy uh, Long Island suffragist was Harriet Burton Laidlaw. She uh, grown up in Albany, moved to New York City, taught high school English until she married James Lees Laidlaw in 1905. The Laidlaws lived in New York City and had a country home in Sands Point on the North Shore of Nassau County. Harriet Laidlaw became Manhattan suffrage chairman in 1909 and later was vice chairman of the state woman suffrage party and also an officer of the National American Woman Suffrage Association from 1911 to 1920. Laidlaw was a founding member of the Port Washington Women's Suffrage League in 1913, headed the successful 1917 suffrage campaign in Nassau County. All of Laidlaw's suffrage activities were within the mainstream organization, NASA, or its affiliates. She opposed more militant approaches. She wrote a suffrage handbook, toured with her husband in the West for suffrage, campaigned by automobile on Long Island, uh, distributing suffrage leaflets and marched in parades in New York City. A biographer has called Laidlaw an eloquent speaker, an indefatigable worker, and a conscientious lieutenant for suffrage. Her husband, James, who was a banker, was prominent in the New York Men's League for Women's Suffrage and the organizer and president of the National Men's League for Women's Suffrage from 1912 to 1920. Their daughter remembered men heckling the shrieking sisterhood marching in suffrage praise, but that her father and other men in the praise endured the loudest boos and call, cat calls. The daughter donated a banner that Laidlaw had carried in one of the suffrage parades to the Port Washington Library. The banner proclaimed, in deeds of daring rectitude, in scorn of miserable aims that end in self. That's a quotation from a poem by the woman writer George Eliot, and it is also on her gravestone. I think it's interesting that James uh, Laidlaw is named on a national honor roll as well as on this New York State suffrage honor roll that the League of Women Voters erected in Albany. Harriet Laidlaw is only on the state plaque, not the national honor roll. 
Uh, you can't read all the names there on the plaque, uh, but uh, there are a number of Long Island women who are leaders that are mentioned there. Um, there is a, a Brooke Kroger's book uh, entitled Suffragettes, How Women Used Men to Get the Vote. vote. And it indicates the important role that James Laidlaw and other men had uh, in achieving women's suffrage. After all, they were the ones who had to vote for it. Another Long Islander important in the movement, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, who supported women's suffrage after he became the candidate of the Progressive Party in 1912. There were many less well-known women involved in the suffrage movement on Long Island, whose families were middle-class rather than wealthy socialites. Edna Kearns from Rockville Center was a publicist uh, for uh, suffrage, writing and editing articles for the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, which covered all of geographical Long Island. And the historical marker uh, was, here's Edna Kearns, uh, and the historical marker erected for her in, uh, on the boardwalk in Long Beach last year. And here you see the dedication of it. Uh, Marguerite Kearns wrote a book uh, last year on her grandmother called An Unfinished Revolution. Kearns toured Long Island in the spirit of uh, 1776 wagon, which was given uh, to the state suffrage organization in 1913. Kearns used this wagon for several years in campaigning. Um, her granddaughter donated the wagon to the New York State Museum in Albany, where it was exhibited. And also automobiles were used. And here you see one decorated with, with Kearns at the wheel. Um, this is my commercial, if you will, for Antonio Petrush's book um, on Long Island suffrage, where you'll find some of the pictures you've been seeing and much more. Um, these news girls are at the S Suffolk County Fair selling copies of the Women's Journal. Uh, Harriet Stanton Blatch, uh, whom I mentioned earlier, was Elizabeth Cady Stanton's uh, younger daughter. And here's the picture of her again as an infant in, the, um, when, in her mother's arms. Uh, Blatch became Stanton's political disciple in the suffrage movement. After traveling in Europe, uh, she uh, married an Englishman, William Henry Blatch in 1882. They lived outside London for two decades, and they were involved with the Fabian Society and militant English suffrage activities. Harriet and her husband returned permanently to the United States in 1902, lived in Shoreham Estates on Long Island, which was a summer community. Blatch found the suffrage movement, as she said, quote, completely in a rut in New York State. End quote. She organized what became the Women's Political Union, began holding street meetings and parades in New York City. Though initially regarded as too radical and unfeminine, these parades became popular and respectable annual events with more participants every year. Blatch also focused on lobbying legislators in Albany and targeting suffrage of suffrage opponents for defeats in elections. At the 1914 Suffolk County Fair in Riverhead, Blatch's Women's Political Union had the usual speakers and distribution of literature. Uh, note the news girls on the left in this picture, the same uniform as on the book cover that I showed you earlier. And at the fair, the women offered free infant and child care under that tent, and it was extremely popular. There was an account of a, of a family uh, who left their child there, and it turned out he was, uh, the child was there overnight because the mother thought the husband was picking him up, and 
uh, vice versa. And that converted uh, the husband to suffrage. Nice touch. Um, Elizabeth Halsey White was a Southampton suffragist. She was the first secretary of the local branch of the Women's Political Union. The group gathered petitions for state and federal amendments. White had meetings at her home on Main Street uh, Post House. Uh, there's reported to, they are reported to have cordial dealings with Southampton's anti-suffragists. Uh, the House Southampton suffrage group became part of Alice Paul's Congressional Union. And in the main meeting room of the Rogers Mansion, there is a plaque to Elizabeth White recognizing her contributions as a founder of the Historical Society. And uh, I understand there is information in the uh, Historical Society's blog on Elizabeth White as uh, well on her suffrage activities. Um, Blatch worked closely with Alva Belmont, Alice Paul, and the radical wing of the suffrage movement. After the defeat of um, the New York State 1915 suffrage referendum, Blatch turned her attention to campaigning in Washington, DC, and the West, where she worked with Alice Paul and the Women's Party. She was popular throughout the country as the daughter of Elizabeth Cady Stanton and in her own right as well. Her, uh, Blatch's biographer calls her the chief strategist of the woman suffrage movement in the largest and most important state in the union, which is New York, as well as the senior stateswoman in the campaign that produced the 19th Amendment. Nora Blatch, the infant in this uh, picture, and Nora graduated from Cornell with a degree in civil engineering. She was also involved in suffrage, though not as high profile in the movement as her mother and grandmother. She signed that suffrage petition that I showed you earlier for the governor of New York. Um, and Nora married Lee DeForest, but divorced him before because he objected to her having a career. She became an architect and developer on Long Island, designed a house in Shoreham Estates for her mother, Harriet St Blatch, which still stands. And uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Cady Stanton also lived in Shoreham for a number of years, as I mentioned. The final Long Island women, woman I want to discuss this morning is Louisina. Havemeyer, uh, another of the socialite suffragists. She had a country home in Islip and became active in suffrage after her husband died in 1907. Havemeyer joined Blatch in the Radical Women's Party. Uh, Blatch convinced Havemeyer that she could speak in public. We forget today how intimidating it was, especially at that time, for women uh, to speak in public, though it's public speaking is still feared by many women and men. Uh, the Havemeyers were art collectors and she had exhibits of her cassette and other impressionist paintings to raise money for suffrage besides contributing money herself. Uh, nearly 2000 paintings from her collection were later donated to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, which uh, still owns them. When suffrage parades no longer attracted attention, Blatch asked Havemeyer if she would go on a 10-day speaking tour upstate in 1915. East Hampton's May Manson brought her the torch from, a, from Montauk that you see in this picture. Havemeyer carried it in her car to Buffalo, averaging seven speeches a day at arranged stops. Havemeyer later toured in New Jersey with the torch and after relinquishing it to others, she commissioned another torch, which was topped by an 18 inch long ship of state, which lit up with 33 battery powered lights that you see here. Her motto for it was, and I quote, no light, 
where there is no freedom. In 1917, Havemeyer participated in picketing at the White House and in a demonstration which burned an effigy of President Wilson. These activities were organized by Alice Paul and the militants. Havemeyer was arrested for obstructing traffic. She was 67 or 68 at that time, gutsy woman, I would say. Uh, her family was not happy that she was doing these things. Uh, arrested for, as I said, she was jailed, force fed. And uh, when she went on a hunger strike in 1919, after New York achieved suffrage, she was on a special train of suffragists who had served time in jail, the prison special. And this is a, a, the prison pin that they received, those uh, suffragists received. Carrie Chapman Catt became president of the National American Woman Suffrage Association in 1916. And aided by the more militant tactics of Harriet Blatch and Alice Paul in their women's party, achieved the vote for women in New York State in 1917, when the statewide suffrage referendum was successful. In Nassau County, and in, uh, in Nassau County, Suffolk County, and statewide. 54% uh, statewide voted in favor of women's suffrage. And of course, those were all men who had the right to vote. Since New York was the largest state, the first in the East to win votes for women, it was an important victory in, on the road to achieving national suffrage. The suffrage amendment barely secured the necessary two thirds vote in both houses of Congress. Finally, on June 4th, 1919, and 12 days later, on June 16, the New York State Legislature ratified the federal amendment. But ratification by the necessary three-fourths of the state was not easy. Some states did have partial suffrage, but as you can see on this map, uh, southern states voted against it. They feared that it would mean Black women voting, uh, and it came down to Tennessee. Uh, where victory was uncertain. Harry Burns, the youngest legislature, legislator in the Tennessee at 24, changed his position on suffrage after getting a vote, a note from his mother who wrote, be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat put the rat in ratification. He later said, I know a mother's advice is always safest for a boy to follow and my mother wanted me to vote for suffrage. And it was by his one vote that the 19th Amendment was ratified by three fourths of the states in August 1920, extended the vote to women nationwide, though it wasn't universal. Chinese Native Americans were not citizens at that time. And most blacks in the South, uh, men and women uh, were unable to vote because of various kinds of restrictions until um, 19, uh, after 1965 Civil Rights Act. Incidentally, Mississippi was the last state to ratify the amendment, 1984, though officially women could vote there um, since 1920. Uh, NASA dissolved, having achieved its goal, uh, and CAT, as I mentioned, uh, founded the League of Women Voters. Um, in the centennial for suffrage, the United States Post Office issued this stamp in, 19, in 2020. Alice Paul continued the Women's Party, proposed an Equal Rights Amendment introduced in Congress initially in 1923. 1970s increased efforts for that amendment. Um, but it failed to be ratified by the necessary number of states. Virginia passed it recently, but other states rescinded their ratification. Uh, but many of the gains of the ER uh, uh, promised in the amendment have been achieved by other means, Title IX or uh, in, in civil rights acts and such. As such. Uh, the most active years of the women's suffrage campaign on Long Island spanned 
less than a decade, involved many more women than the leaders that I've mentioned here today. Um, I have a chapter on suffrage in my book on women in Long Island's past, and you can read much more in Antonio Petrich's book, uh, Long Island and the Women's Suffrage Movement. So I thank you for your attention.